So I'm going to start sharing screen. And I'm going to click the right document. And does everyone see that? Okay, we're going to go up, no spoilers. Um, present. So good morning, everyone. Um, today, we're going to be going through there's only really three topics today, so it's less than usual, and you don't have HEPA HKS, which is unusual. But it starts to get a bit more fun this week, in my opinion. You do micro, so you're going to start learning the names of microorganisms and bacteria that you're going to have to really know forever. Tissue damage and repair is really important theory about injury. And homeostasis and coagulation are relevant to investigations you'll be doing all the time. Um, a disclaimer, the micro is not too hard this week. Um, tissue damage and repair isn't too hard. Homeostasis and coagulation is hard. So yeah, just so you know before we get started. Um, we usually use the yield system. Today, only two of us were available, so we did not do the yield system, but we'll generally tell you something, you, what you need to know, what you don't need to know. Sometimes we add in the yield after we've presented as well. So now we're going to get started with microbiology with Mandy Mouse. Introduction. So there's, this is a quick overview of microorganisms that exist. And for all living organisms, there are three domains. These include bacteria, which are prokaryotes, archaea, which are prokaryotes, and eukarya, which are eukary eukaryotes. And this is a little table just to give it context. So what actually is a microorganism? So a microorganism by definition is an organism that's too small to be seen without magnification. So some pathogenic examples include bacteria, protozoa, um, and protozoa. Um, protozoa are unicellular eukaryotes, and I discussed that a bit more in the speaking notes. Let's have a look, because actually it's not too important. But... So a protist is any eukaryotic animal that is not an animal, plant, or fungus. A protozoa is any um, organism that's a unicellular eukaryote. So I got those two definitions confused when I studied this, so I thought I'd chuck that in there. Um, algae are protists. They use usually unicellular or multicellular, but they're eukaryotes. You have fungi, which can be mushrooms, molds, or yeasts. They're mostly multicellular eukaryotes. However, there are some unicellular eukaryotes. The three main pathogens, two main pathogens, three main pathogens we focus on are bacteria, fungi, and viruses. A virus is non-cellular and not generally considered living. Therefore, it's not really an organism. However, sometimes it is classified as a microorganism for convenience. Helminths are, um, I'll show you here. Helminths are just eukaryotic worm-like parasites. So they're parasitic. And part of their lifestyle, life cycle involves microscopic eggs and larvae. These are really important because they're important in diagnosing particular parasitic infections clinically, you can take stool samples. And they're also important for transmitting and contributing to the disease state. However, the helminth themselves are usually visible to the eye, so they're not considered microorganisms, but then microscopic eggs and larvae are. This is a bit of a table comparing prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, which is gonna be drilled into you. And I assume you did this in bio. I didn't do bio, but I imagine you would have. Prokaryotes are unicellular, whereas uni eukaryotes can be unicellular or multicellular. Prokaryotes do not have a distinct nucleus. Eukaryotes do have a distinct nucleus, and DNA is surrounded by a membrane. In the prokaryote, the genetic material is in something called a nucleoid. In eukaryotes, it's in something called the nucleus. Prokaryotes do not have membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotes do have membrane-bound organelles. Important to know, Ribosomes are in both. A ribosome is not a membrane-bound organelle. Um, in prokaryotes, transcription and translation occur simultaneously. In eukaryotes, they occur separately and they're separated by time and space. In prokaryotes, DNA is a singular circular chromosome. In DNA, it's wound in little protein complexes called histones and is in linear shapes and is compacted in that regards. Uh, prokaryotes are quite simple structure but they're generally smaller and they have three main shapes, which we'll just talk about in a minute. Eukaryotes are generally more complex, but it's important to recognize that chemically, they're both complex. Chemically, they both have different complicated metabolic reactions that occur. So they might ask you is a difference between a false question and an exam question might be prokaryotes 
are sim are chemically simple eukaryotes or chemically complex, that would be false. They're both chemically complex, but structurally simple. Um, prokaryotes generally have a complex cell wall that is thick and protective. Gram positive, we'll talk about what these are in a moment, but they're just ways to classify different types of bacteria. And this is the classification. A gram positive bacteria has a cell wall that consists of peptidoglycan, which forms the external surface. Picture this coming up. Gram negative has an outer layer rich in lipopolysaccharides. Whereas a eukaryote, as you will know, has a simple cell wall and simple cell membranes for humans. Cell wall, plants, cell membrane for humans. Um, prokaryotes are quite variable and durable. They can exist in many environments. Environments You could probably remember attack polymerase, just by volcanoes. Whereas eukaryotes were quite restricted in the environments we can exist in. Prokaryotes are voted by binary fission, eukaryotes by mitosis and meiosis. Hopefully that is all familiar. Um, these are, like I've mentioned before, they are, these are a distinction that have been asked in quizzes. Prokaryotes and eukaryotes are chemically actually quite similar. They perform and undergo similar reactions with similar metabolites, chemicals, inclusions, DNA is made of the same nitrogenous bases. All of that is quite chemically complex and similar. Structurally, they are very different. And what are some significant features of eukaryotes? Essentially, all of the organelles. That's basically all that's mentioned here. I will mention that they have different ribosomes. In eukaryotes, you have a um, 80S subunit ribosome with 40S small subunit and 60S larger subunit. And these are important in the um, antibiotics. So you can specifically target prokaryotic ribosomes and not affect eukaryotic ribosomes because they have different structures. Um, now I'm gonna talk about some prokaryotes. I am going to be focusing on bacteria and not protozoa or other things like that. Um, almost all prokaryotes are unicellular. They lack true nucleus and membrane-bound organelles as we talked about before. Genetic information is carried in long double-stranded circular molecules of DNA. Um, long double-stranded circular molecules. DNA is coiled in a region termed the nucleoid. This is a nucleoid, it's just a vague region. These little more circle, circle um, strands of DNA are called plasmids. These are a bit different to the general nucleoid structure of the bacteria. Plasmids can be actually transmitted between bacteria through something called conjugation. And this is how they can transfer resistance to each other, which is something to keep in mind. Um, transcription and translation are possible, but it's, what's um, significant is post-translational modifications are much more limited than in many eukaryotes. So you can probably remember when we were doing cloning, we were saying, when would you choose bacteria? When would you choose yeast? When would you choose eukaryotes? Um, the post-translational modifications in bacteria is much less sophisticated than in eukaryotes. And there are three main bacterial shapes which are important in their classification. Um, more features of prokaryotes. So as we said before, they have a cell wall and the cell wall consists of peptidoglycan. And this is important to clinically target bacteria because essentially in a clinical setting, in order to treat an infection, what is the difference between a bacteria cell and normal human cells? Because we don't want to affect human cells. And one of the huge um, differentiations is that the cell wall of a prokaryote has peptidoglycan. So we're going to try and inhibit the synthesis of peptidoglycan, which is essentially how a penicillin or moxicillin works, which you'll talk about later. Um, they also have an outer membrane. Um, this is more particular to gram negative. And um, the LPS component of the, this is for next semester, but it contains LPS, which contains lipid A, which is very toxic. So that's why gram negative bacteria generally are very toxic and they have shock effects. Gram positive are generally less severe, generally easier to treat, generally have less of a toll on the patient. So you could, it's a simplification, but if you think gram negative worse, gram positive better, that's okay for now. Um, the plasma membrane performs many metabolic functions in the prokaryotic cells, um, which would usually be performed by membrane-bound organelles in eukaryotes. It's important for structural integrity and transportation. Here's just a little example. Um, we have some pili, which are used for adhesions and communication with other bacteria. You have a capsule sometimes, which is um, quite, it's a polysaccharide, so it's quite sticky and it allows adhesion. Here's our nucleoid. Yeah. Um, the cytoplasm, as you know, is just fluid and materials enclosed by plasma membrane. And in ribosomes, 
And for ribosomes in prokaryotes, they're in the cytoplasm and they have a 70S subunit as opposed to 80S subunit. And I imagine in my speaking notes, I'm talking about the difference in treatments. You know that they contain water, ions, and proteins. A nucleoid is tightly coiled. It's not as tightly coiled as a eukaryote, which has histine protein complexes to coil around, which is dependent on the affinity. Here it doesn't have that, but it's very tightly coiled. And they're double-stranded circular molecules, and these are their chromosomes. And they could continue a sequence of genes. So I don't know if you remember, but when we were talking about eukaryotic um, genetic material, they had introns and extrons in junk DNA. Often the introns were spliced out, or you could have different selective sort of splicing of extrons. Here you don't. It's just a continuous sequence of DNA. It's simultaneously translated and transcribed. There's no nuclear membrane present. Um, extra chromosome DNA. So plasmids are not in the nucleoid. Remember that? You're, I'm sure you remember plasmids from, again from the cloning and the production of insulin. Plasmids are not in the nucleoid. They are separately. They can replicate independently of chromosomal DNA. Um, just a visual difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. I think we've talked about this enough. Cell wall, let's talk more about the cell wall. Some bacteria are classified according to the thickness of peptidoglycan in their cell wall. It's gram positive or gram negative. Gram positive has a thick peptidoglycan layer and it's external to the cell membrane. So here is our cell wall. This is all peptidoglycan. Gram negative, you can see, is a bit different. You have much limited peptidoglycan, it isn't a significant. You have, um, what do you have? You've got some O antigen, lipid A, these are toxins, endotoxins. You have a space in between. Um, you have a thin strip of peptidoglycan as opposed to the thick strip. And you have um, lipoproteins that are adjacent here. Who cares? Um, so peptidoglycan provides a hydrophilic surface and can resist bile in intestines. Its layer can be disrupted by lysosomes, lysozymes. That's why you have lysozymes in tears and in saliva. They disrupt the cell membrane. Um, Jonathan will talk about that in a minute. Um, and synthesis of peptidoglycan is disrupted by certain antibiotics. Beta lactam family, talk about that in the notes. This is amoxicillin, cephalexin, I think. Um, yeah. Um, great. Um, perhaps even more important, gram-negative. Um, it has a hydrophilic outer membrane, hydrophobic inner membrane. LPS um, can contribute. To, essentially, you don't need to know this. Contributes to fever, shock, blood coagulation, weakness, inflammation, hemorrhage, horrible stuff. Gram-negative can lead to septic shock. And there are some exceptions which are quite high yield. Um, so some of the exceptions include um, tuberculosis, myobacterium tuberculosis. These have a bacteria to have a waxy lipid in the cell membrane. This means when you're trying to stain them, the stain doesn't stick to them. So they don't stain as gram positive or gram negative, which is dependent on the peptidoglycan. These need to be um, st used stain with a specialized stain known as a Zeal-Nelson acid fast stain. Remember this Zeal-Nelson Nielsen acid fast stain in myobacterium tuberculosis, super high yield. It has mycolic acid, certain, there's certain, um, Drugs that particularly target TB, rifampicin, isonazide, these don't mean anything to you, but these target based on the different mycolic acids, different structures. How can you tell if a bacteria is gram negative or gram positive? If it is gram positive, the carbohydrate mesh in the peptidoglycan will absorb a crystal violet dye and appear purple. If it's gram negative, there's much smaller peptidoglycan. It's harder to absorb because as you can remember, it has to pass through all of this stuff to reach the peptidoglycan. So it's not as well retained. It's unwashed off. Ethanol washes away the crystal violet dye and the counter stain to this is a pink, um, pink bacteria. All you really need to remember is gram positive stains purple, gram negative stains pink. I've mentioned this, I've mentioned this. This will become more relevant when you do pharma, particular pharma drugs. Um, here are some just external structures to bacteria that allow them to survive. And also some of them are virulent factors. So for example, flagella are important for motility. Um, you remember flagella from sperms, but there's some bacteria, for example, you might have heard 
of H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, maybe not. That's the bacteria in your gut. It's the thing that Guy in Perth drank antibiotics to prove and he got a Nobel Prize for it. Those have flagella and those flagella actually used to like propel itself into the intestinal mucosa and neutralize acid there. Um, they have capsules, which makes them able to evade phagocytic and immune processes. It also allows them to adhere and create biofilms. Pili and fimbrae allow them to adhere, to communicate each other, to pass plasmids, as we talked about before, which can contribute to antibiotic resistance. And some bacteria can be in spores, which are very hard to neutralize and get rid of. They're especially in grounds. Um, high yield exam question, someone falls off a motorbike, they have spores and that's a resistant way for the bacteria to survive. Fungi have them as well. Some of them have them as well. And I've talked about here, I've gone in a lot of detail. You don't need to, you probably actually do need to know all this detail, but you'll slowly get along. Flagella is helical, it's whip-like, and it's often used for propulsion. Um, it's proton dependent in prokaryotes. So you remember when we were talking about the electron transport change, when we were making ATP, those were proton dependent. You had H plus ions flowing down. So it's a similar concept that's generating energy when the H plus is flowing down. Structure is not important. It's an antigen. An antigen, um, I don't know if you had, to, have we given them in the immune lecture stuff yet? Don't think so. But an antigen, maybe you remember from bio, is just a particular structure or protein on a bacteria that is pathogenic. It's recognized by the immune system as being pathogenic. And one of the associated molecular patterns of pathogens is a flagella. So you have a toll-like receptor five. Toll-like receptors are part of your innate immunity. They're on. Um, they're they're technically non-specific, but this kind of blurs the line. There's, they um, recognize flagella, and they know that this is a pathogen. There's not things with um, flagella that should be by the skin, and it's going to activate an innate immune response. It also facilitates chemotaxis, which is attraction or repellent by stimuli. And there may be several flagella on one side. They may, be, they may be evenly spaced out. They may be all over the place, so they're differently structured. Um, pili, two types. Short type of pili is called fimbrae. Um, these are used for adherence. They can adhere to inanimate objects and host cells. So you might have heard of the word fomite before. The fomite is just a normal object that harbors a pathogen, and it, it is adhered to by the pathogen, often by short pili known as fimbrae. Sometimes the fimbrae will form together to create biofilms, and um, they can essentially prevent the removal through innate defenses. So you can't cough, you can't flush. Oh, my computer's going to die. Let's charge my computer. They can't flush, they can't die. And it's hard for antibiotics to target them. So important concepts. Lon pili are generally known as sex pili or conjugation pili, and they allow adjacent bacteria to adjoin and transfer genetic material, often by transferring plasmids. I, I'm assuming you're familiar with plasmids just from the cloning stuff. What is a capsule? All of this is bolded, but it's not all important. I don't know why I did that. A capsule is a high molecular weight polysaturide. It's basically these carbohydrates that surround the pathogen. They're often hydrated, which means um, a bacteria can adhere to a surface and not dry out. Desiccate is to dry out. You might remember that from your epithelium. You have keratinized epithelium, which prevents desiccation or drying out. It has a sticky structure to aid in adherence to host cells. And I just mentioned fomites and inanimate objects. It evades the immune system. The immune system can't recognize the antigens and it provides protection against phagocytosis because just such a large structure that's hard to overcome. It protects bacteria against hydrophobic toxins due to the hydration and the capsule may enclose bacteria and, and it form adhesive biofilms. Um, this is something that I don't, they mention. I haven't seen in any PSPs or revision lectures before, but I thought I'd put it in because who knows, but you probably should know it. There are three kind of words you should know because as I've mentioned before, prokaryotes are quite durable. They're found in quite a range of extreme environments. Taclimerase can create heat, cold. I mean, you know, they're like these little amoebas. That's not important, so I won't talk about that. There's obligate aerobes, which grow in oxygen, and there is no growth if there's no oxygen. So this is some pathogens can be gram-negative or gram-positive. Another word to classify them is these little words over here, which no one ever explains. So I thought maybe I would. Um, an obligate anaerobe grows in an absence of oxygen. So there's no growth in oxygen. And a facultative anaerobe or anaerobe can grow in oxygen and growth in absence of oxygen. So it can grow in both. 
Um, some classification, which is meaningless to you right now, but you've got the bacteria, you've got the shape cocci. Can someone write in the chat what cocci look like? I don't know if this is stupid, depending on what you did in bio, but I don't know what you did in bio. So does anyone know what cocci look like? Can you describe it? Uh, yeah, round balls. That's dirty, but yes, correct. And bacilli, does anyone know another word for bacilli? Let's be less phallic if we can. This has been recorded, I should be appropriate. Bacilli, exactly. And um, does anyone, <laughs> um, does anyone know what, um, I'm assuming you know, aerobic means oxygen, anaerobic means without oxygen clusters, chains, and pairs, or in this, the rest of this you don't really need to know. Right now, I'd be very happy if you just knew the shape, if it's aerobic, anaerobic. Um, you'll learn clusters of cocci that are gram positive, look purple, are staph aureus. They look like grapes. That's how they describe them. Pyogenes are chains. Um, very high yield. If you learn this now, you're gonna hear it a million times, but nice to learn now. Um, viruses are very small. They require electron microscopy. They are much smaller than bacteria generally. They're cellular, cellular, and some people say they're non-living. They're probably non-living. Um, they're obligate intracellular parasite. That means they have to be, they require host machinery to replicate and disseminate. By themselves, they can't, they're not really, they don't, they're not alive. So they need to, they need to be inside of a cell in order to work. Um, a virion is an, of course, a term for the infective form of a virus. Again, I know I explained what a virion was. I mean, they pro probably should have been able to figure it out, but I thought I'd put it in. The virion is the infectious particle that transmits viral genetic material, and the virus genome is surrounded by a protein capsid. So a virus and a protein capsid is a nuclear capsid, and these often have shapes. Some shapes are icosahedral, helical, or complex, and sometimes it's even enveloped by lipid bilayer, which is often a result of, um, I'll read the chat in a second, which is often a result of the host cell. Is there a third shape? I think there's a million shapes. I just put in the high yield ones. But um, John, do you mind just searching up all the shapes of viruses and let us know? Yeah, sure thing. I, I'm almost 100% sure there are more shapes, but I just put in those. I feel like complex has more classifications to it. The main ones are icos icosahedral and helical. I could be wrong, we'll see. Um, did I do the slide? Yeah, I did. Yeah, this is me. Um, there's types of nucleic acid. There's different ways to describe different viruses depending on the, whether they have RNA or DNA. Viruses can't have RNA or DNA. These can either be double-stranded or single-stranded. And this is important for the classification. And you're also gonna define them based on their morphology. Does anyone know what morphology means? And it means appearance. So their shape, their size, their symmetry, whether they have an envelope, which is that lipid pi layer, which can be present or absent. Um, these are some of the stages to viral replication. This is, I pushed this from a lecture. Um, you essentially have attachment, it's going to bind with a receptor. I can give you an example if you want, but it might be too much for now. But if you have influenza, it binds to. Neuromidase, no, that's just gonna confuse you. Don't worry, we'll talk about that later. But if we have um, a virus, it's gonna interact with the protein receptor, then it's gonna penetrate into the cell. And this lipid bilayer, this capsid sheath lipid bilayer has to kind of um, uncoat what's called shed. And when it sheds, the DNA can be incorporated. Either it can be in the cytoplasm and be transcribed, it can go to the nucleus and be transcribed. HIV is going to go to the nucleus, it's going to be reverse transcribed into the DNA itself, which you can imagine is very hard to treat. Um, then it's going to trick the cell into making many more of its own um, particles. And then those particles are eventually going to bud. And they get, this is where that lipid bilayer comes from. Any luck with that, Donna? Yeah, the last one was spiral shaped. Spiral shaped, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that's all for me. Um, I'm just thinking whether it's worth explaining the influenza stuff or not. Do you reckon it's too early for the hemoglobin and neuromidase? I think it's just going to be confusing, Jonah. 
Uh, yeah, potentially. Maybe we can go to that in the coming yeah. weeks. Yeah. I think you muted yourself. I muted myself. I said, I'm going to stop sharing now. I'll throw it over to Jonathan. And I said, I agree that it was too much for now. Thank you very much, David. Things share disabled, so you might just have to enable it for me. Yeah, nice. um, Daniel, Neuramide stuff is next semester. So some of the Anki stuff, a lot of what the kids do is they build onto them for the whole year. So yeah, as a sort of case, like, yeah, okay, good. Um, we'll just talk about it later. Otherwise, we have nothing to talk about later. How do I make you co-host? I've made you co-host. A sultamavir. When do they do a sultamavir? That's this cement. So you actually learn about it next week. So we don't need to jump the gun. John is turn. Still not working. Sorry. Devastate. I'll just share for you if it doesn't work again. But so, are you co-host? No, not yet. Yes, I want to make you co-host. Are you co-host now? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Great, right. uh, so I'll be taking you guys through natural barriers now. Uh, so basically uh, we've learned about all these different microbes. So how does our body actually protect us from them? Uh, so to start off the learning objectives, uh, we want to describe the natural barriers of the human body to infection and discuss the innate defense mechanisms. So this will include anatomical barriers, mechanical, antimicrobial and chemical factors and cellular components. And to finish off, we'll also look at some normal flora and their role in the human body, and also briefly the different host parasite interactions. So the main barriers are anatomical, mechanical, antimicrobial substances, cellular components, and inflammation. So to start off with, anatomical barriers include our skin. So this is a tough physical barrier which prevents pathogens from entering our body, basically. Um, of note is that bacteria does live on our skin and we call these commensal bacteria. Uh, other anatomical barriers include the mucous membranes in our cells and these are basically sticky films. So uh, they are found in our respiratory and GI tracts. And what these mucous oh, membranes do... Mm -hmm. uh, have you changed slides? Because they're saying they can't see the changed slides. And I don't know, we don't have a thank you, Jeff. John, it doesn't uh, Yeah, I've oh, changed slides. It's it's, not sure. Oh, there we go. Um, Zach, can you see now? Um, yep, I can. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, and so mucous membranes, they're really sticky. They help trap microbes and expel them from the body. having some tech issues. Sorry, everyone. Let me know if you want me to share for you. I'm happy to as well. Sorry about that, guys. Can you see this okay? Yeah, that looks good. Yep. yep, all good. So, oh, perfect. So next we have mechanical barriers and the mucus that we talked about earlier, it actually works with cilia. So remember cilia, they're these protrusions on our epithelial cells and we find them in our respiratory tract. So what the cilia do, they uh, beat in wave-like motions and it moves the mucus, sort of propels the mucus up out of our respiratory tract and the microbes that are trapped in the mucus, they get removed uh, along with it. So we call this the mucociliary escalator. And once the mucus uh, gets moved up our respiratory tract, other mechanical barriers that our body uses include coughing and sneezing to get rid of our mucus, and also vomiting and diarrhea to expel microbes from our uh, GI system. 
Uh, next, we have antimicrobials that sort of help. Yeah, John, yeah, that these hasn't are... screen. Was that supposed to change screen? Uh, yeah, strange. Let, let me share for you. So I'll share screen. Um, where is it unpublished with no share? Okay, cool. Uh, slide 40. Yeah, sorry about the extension stuff. I don't worry about it at all. Uh, tell me when to stop. Have, so have, guys, have you been able to see these as he's been talking? Yeah, I think so. Oh, I did not see the I'm image so of that previous one. I did not see this image. Here it is. Didn't show up earlier. Yes, yeah, so mucus important concepts. Sorry, John, which one are we up to? Um, my, my Zoom is like disappeared. I am trying to fix it. Can you hear me? Well, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, um, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I might have to like quit Zoom. I'll it's okay. be back as soon as possible. Sure, no worries. Um, can someone tell me what slide he was up to and I'll cover for him for a bit. I think he remember? covered this slide. He covered this, did he cover this? Uh, no, this one was the next one. Sure, thank you so much. Um, hopefully he comes back soon because I don't want to steal his thunder, but I helped him with these bits, that's fine. But um, you have essentially on your skin, in order to have this innate non-specific protection, you have fatty acids and lactic acid, and they kind of are damaging to the pathogens. You have gastric acid, which is really important. Your gastric acid in your stomach is incredibly low pH. And the acidic environment is basically, there's very little things that can survive in such an acidic environment. And that's a way to kind of knock it in your just digestive system to get it out of your body. There are a few microbes that exist in the gastric system. I talked about H. pylori and these work, they don't actually live in a low pH, but they work by neutralizing the stomach. And that's something for next semester, but you no know, gastric acid, low pH, things can't survive. Lactic acid, acid protects the body. Um, pepsin is a digestive enzyme that hydrolyzes proteins and microbes, which destroys them. The word pep is generally gonna to refer to protein. So, John is back. John? Yeah, I'm back now. So sorry, everyone. Having a bit of a bad tech day today. Computer I, just, I got up to pepsin, but- Okay, your turn. sweet. Thanks so much. Yeah, so after peps, uh, so pepsin, basically it's a digestive enzyme and it hydrolyzes the proteins of microbes, destroying them. Uh, some other antimicrobial substances, we have lysosome, uh, lysozymes. So David touched on these earlier. So like pepsin, these are hydrolytic enzymes and they're found in our mucus, saliva, also our tears, and they break down that peptidoglycan uh, bacteria wall. We also have defensins. These basically punch holes in microbes, killing them. And cytokines, these are um, signaling molecules, and they uh, tell the cells of our immune system, basically, oh, there's an infection, and tells them to migrate to the area. And they also help mediate inflammation, which we will touch on later. Finally, complement. I might remember this from your immune system lectures. These are just small proteins that are floating around in your blood plasma. So normally they don't do anything, but when they detect pathogens, they are activated and help eliminate them. Yep. So next I'll look at the cells that are involved in the natural barriers. So mainly this is just the white blood cells of our immune system. Uh, so innate immunity plays the biggest role initially and it takes a while for our adaptive immunity to kick in. So cells of our uh, immune system, a bit of revision, we have our phagocytes, which includes neutrophils, monocytes, which differentiate into macrophages, dendritic cells, 
And we also have inflammatory cells, which release cytokines, basophils, mast cells, and eosinophils. And we also have natural killer cells. So their roles, they can kill the body's own cells when something goes wrong. For example, when a cell is infected with a virus or turns cancerous, and they achieve this by using um, MHC identification. And natural killer cells, they kill using perforin, which forms a pore in the target cell's membrane. So yeah, we have our innate immunity and that plays the biggest role. Um, it's one of the first lines of defense uh, before adaptive immunity kicks in. And inflammation is another process that our body uses to protect against microbes. So we have five signs. This is uh, important and will be drilled into you. So the five signs are redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function. So redness, that's due to vasodilation. So our blood vessels dilate, which allows more blood flow into an area of inflammation, making it look red. You have heat, and that's due to increased blood volume, and also uh, pyrogens, which are chemicals that cause fever. We have swelling. That's because the um, endothelium lining our blood vessels, they become more leaky and permeable. So more fluid leaks out from the blood vessels into the tissue. We also have pain, and that's due to neuron stimulation and loss of function. Next slide, please, Dave. So there's just a question I might discuss with you because I can't like click and follow at the same time. If you punch a hole in a virally infected cell, isn't that a really bad thing? Can then all the virus particles just leak out? So there's two mechanisms. You, John, correct me if I'm wrong. There's essentially two mechanisms for destroying a cell. One is in the induction of apoptosis. And generally what happens is when you induce apoptosis, you release all the hydrolytic enzymes, all the enzymes that break down protein. So you need some resources for that cell to be able to replicate itself. And when you initiate apoptosis, you're initially just destroying all the nutrients, everything involved in the cell. Um, often the transcription and the release of viral particles is quite an end stage thing. It takes quite a bit of time. If this is an innate response, it's happening quite readily, quite superficially, and hopefully it hasn't gotten to that stage yet. But generally, no, if you punch a hole in a cell, all the contents are going to fly out. And generally, this um, virus isn't going to have a, either not going to have a chance to be produced or the enzymes that have been released from the lysozymes that are really toxic and really inhospitable to really any structure that has protein in it will um, destroy them. But yeah, I, I imagine, don't you think if it's an end stage and you've released a yeah, because when the cell lyses, the viruses go up. But generally, when you've had enough virus proliferation, that cell's going to have lysed before your immune system has. What do you think, Jono? Yeah, you pretty much summed it up. Daniel, is that okay? Sorry to call you out. I didn't mean to. Anonymous, is that okay? Awesome. Right. Yeah, so inflammation, uh, it's a good thing because it protects against microbes. Uh, so first of all, if we have a local inflammatory response, what happens is that those cytokines, which we talked about earlier, uh, they include uh, tissue necrosis factor or TNF and interleukin-1. Don't need to know these in too much detail, but basically cytokines such as these make the endothelium leaky and sticky. And what this does, it means that it's easier for white blood cells uh, to migrate into the tissue. So first of all, uh, when the endothelium is sticky, it's gonna attract more white blood cells into the area. And when it's leaky, it makes it easier for those white blood cells to pass from the blood vessel into the tissue. So remember the process. Uh, so you had, a heat you had uh, adhesion of the macrophages and then also rolling and then sort of passing through into the tissue. When we have a systemic inflammatory response, this often involves pyrexia or fever. And so it really tells us that something is wrong. And whenever we have fever, it often signals that we have an infection going on, whether it's uh, bacterial or viral. And functions of fever, uh, it basically speeds up our immune reactions 
and it can also complicate temperature specific pathogens. So bacteria which only survive within a uh, really narrow temperature range, uh, fever can basically yeah, mess with that. So move on to normal flora now. So what are normal flora? They're basically microorganisms that live on our body and they're not harmful. And so they are acquired rapidly and shortly after birth and they're really important for our immunity as well. So firstly, they help train the immune system and also they act as um, competitors against potential pathogens and they can still, uh, yeah, they can compete against pathogens for nutrients in space which makes them more difficult for potential pathogens to proliferate. And we can classify normal flora into two types, transient, so meaning they come and go, and resident flora, they basically stay permanently. So some of the methods of normal flora in preventing colonization by potential pathogens, so on your skin, normal flora can take up space and nutrients and also produce those fatty acids, which protect against pathogens. In the gut, they can ferment unused energy substrates, so reducing energy available for pathogens, and also produce bacteria, uh, bactericins and colicins. They can train the immune system and also synthesize and excrete vitamins. And also uh, lactobacilli in the vagina, uh, these create an acidic environment which suppresses bacteria, uh, which uh, suppresses pathogen growth. Yeah, so some parts of the human body uh, don't have normal flora. So when we find bacteria in those areas, what it can indicate is an infection. So for example, where we shouldn't find microbes, basically areas that should be sterile, include our brain, our blood, and also internal tissues. Um, but other areas such as the skin, gut, nose, and urinary tract, it's perfectly normal to find um, microbes there. So normal flora, um, they're not always non-harmful. Sometimes they can become opportunistic. This is basically where normal flora becomes pathogenic. So staph epidermis is a great example. So normally it's a normal flora on the skin, but it can become opportun uh, opportunistic if during surgery it sort of gets uh, from the skin into the internal tissues and organs. And finally, relationships between microbes and the host, while well, we have mutualism. So this is where both the microbe and the host benefit. Immersed to normal flora fall under this category. So for example, um, normal flora living in our GIT, they not only don't harm us, but they can also benefit us by breaking down um, some metabolites that we otherwise wouldn't be able to. Commensalism is where one benefits and the host is neither harmed nor does it benefit. And this includes some normal flora. And finally, parasitism. So this is where the micro benefits and the host is harmed and pathogens fall under this category. Right, and uh, yeah, these are some good summary uh, diagrams made by David. So we have our first line defenses. You guys can have a look at this in your own time. And also next line. We also have our second line defenses. Um, so we can group our natural barriers into first line and second line. First line is basically our anatomical, mechanical barriers, antimicrobial substances and normal flora, whereas second line includes our cellular components from the immune system, uh, soluble proteins, and also inflammation as a process. And just to uh, quick note on cytokines and chemokines. So cytokines, they're um, chemicals which are involved in signaling and communication. And chemokines are a specific type of cytokine, also known as chemotactic cytokine. So they induce chemotaxis. Uh, so think about this as a movement in response to a stimuli. So you can imagine that um, chemokines help leukocytes chase bacteria. So it uh, gives information to your white blood cells about sort of which direction to move and where to migrate to. Yeah. Did you want to add anything 
for that, David? Uh, no, I'm happy. Just, yeah, I'm just happy with that. Just, just they're used interchangeably sometimes and they're not necessarily the same thing. So just thought I'd put that in there. Uh, next slide, please. Yep. And just a quick review of our innate immunity versus our adaptive immunity. So we have our uh, non-specific broad spectrum stuff in innate immunity. Um, it's immediate and quick, and there's no memory. Whereas with our adaptive immunity, um, memory involves B cells and T cells producing antibodies. So this is specific, and we also have memory there. Yeah, I didn't mean to, I meant to add in, it's also the opposite. So adaptive is um, long, prolonged response and there's memory. Yep, so now we'll look at, were you about to say something? Dave? Yeah, I just got a, there's something going on with my plummet. So I'm gonna quickly text my dad to check it out. While I do so, I'm gonna shut, stop sharing. Does anyone know if you're in a sterile or not? Write your thoughts in the chat while I make sure my house doesn't explode. Gonna read the answers to me. Um, so we have yes, yeah, I think so. Yeah, the whole of the stream. I'm not gonna <laughs> piss on myself. Thanks for letting us know. So urine actually isn't sterile. So the midstream of urination is sterile, but at the very start and the very end aren't necessarily sterile. Now I've told my dad to come check. Out why there's so much noise coming from my pipes and we're gonna go on. Amazing, yeah, so with the urine, basically um, normal flora can live in your urinary tract. So at the start of the stream, it's gonna sort of catch a lot of that uh, bacteria. So it may not necessarily be sterile. So that's why it's sterile during midstream and not at the start or end. And is, um... Is a normal flora upper urinary tract or lower urinary tract? What do you reckon? What have we said? So upper, lower. We had upper and lower. So what you want is the last thing you need is a bladder infection, which is cystitis. So you're generally gonna get um, normal flora more towards the urethral opening. You kind of don't really want it inside of you. Is that, that's right, yeah? I'm pretty sure mm. that's right. Yeah. yeah, it's like the um, opposite of respiratory. Exactly, that's so, why I asked. Yeah, so for your lungs, right, you only have, um, so you don't want them in sort of your lower respiratory tract and really not your upper respiratory tract either. Um, for the, um, yeah, so um, for your urinary tract, it's the opposite. Um, so you have them in your lower urinary tract, but you don't want them in your upper, like David said, you don't want a bladder infection. Yeah, because I also guess the higher you get, the more likely you are for it to ascend to the kidneys, and then you get glomerulonephritis, which isn't fun. Yeah, lower means closer to the urethral opening. Okay, so, right. So what you have is your ureter goes from your kidneys to your bladder, and then your bladder has um, your, that goes out your urethral. Yeah. So it's all of that is included. Um, lower means towards the opening of the urethral stuff. Does that make sense? Lower means closer to the urethral opening. It does not mean near the bladder. I misread the question, sorry. I thought you were asking. Yeah, awesome. Oh, good revision for me as well. Yeah, so now looking at ways for us to actually um, control microbe growth. So learning objectives are understand the chain of infection, ways to control microbe growth, uh, the principles of sterilization and disinfection, agents for both and the application and the importance of controlling nosocomial infections, which is just another word for hospital acquired infections. So uh, this is a pretty chill topic and we'll get straight into it. So the chain of infection, um, they're basically the steps that make an infection proliferate and spread. And so 
As part of infection control, what's really important is to break one or multiple of these steps. So on the diagram at the right, we have our infectious agent, and this then leads to the reservoir. And then from the reservoir, we have port of exit, mode of transmission, port of entry, and the susceptible host. So we're going to each one of these in detail now. The reservoir is where our microbes survive and multiply. So it can be people, equipment, or a little reservoir of water. And from there, we have the port of exit. So this is how the microbes exit the reservoir. So for humans, uh, this could be excretion, uh, could be through droplets, for example, uh, when we cough and sneeze, can be through secretions as well, and uh, yeah, through our skin. And from our port of exit, there's a few ways that our microbes can be transmitted to someone else. Can be through direct contact, could be through fomites, which David touched on earlier. So these are basically just inanimate objects on which the microbes accumulate. Can be through injection, ingestion, airborne, and aerosol. So how do these microbes then enter the host? Well, it can be through a uh, physical defect in our natural barriers, such as broken skin, it can be through openings such as our GIT, our respiratory, and also our uh, urinary tract. Finally, the susceptible host. So if someone is healthy, if all the natural barriers and immune system is intact, it's actually really hard for microbes to uh, get in and infect. So oftentimes when someone is infected, uh, there is something wrong with their defenses. So their natural barriers and immune system may be compromised. These could be due to age, disease, or um, medication as well. Yep, so how do we control microbes? Well, there's three ways. First of all, uh, through cleaning, this is the most low level. So it's basically removing um, bacteria of any organic matter. So uh, moist organic matter supports bacterial growth. This should be removed immediately. Sort of this is a precursor to um, disinfection and sterilizing as well. Um, so disinfection, this is where we remove and kill most viable microorganisms. So key thing is most, but not all. Uh, for skin disinfection, we can use antiseptics. For objects, we can sanitize them as well. And it can be physical. So for example, boiling water or chemical using antiseptics. And finally, sterilization is the most extreme out of all three. So this is where we kill basically all viable microorganisms, uh, including those spores from bacteria and fungi, which may be really hard to destroy. And once again, we have physical and chemical ways to do this. So to start off with, we can use heat. So moist heat, um, sort of like steaming, I guess, uh, we need the temperature to be at 121 degrees and also heat it for 15 minutes. And this will guarantee that we kill all microbes and spores. And yeah, so like David Circle, these are some pretty high yield values. They may test you on it. So remember moist, 121 degrees, um, quarter of an hour. Now, if we use dry heat, that uh, means we need a high temperature, 170 degrees and one hour. We can also have radiation, so UV. So UV is low uh, penetration. So basically it only sterilizes the surface. And one downside is that can damage tissue and plastic. We can also have ionizing gamma radiation, which breaks down microbes. For antibiotics, we can use filtration, where we uh, don't necessarily want to uh, heat our antibiotics. And we can also have other chemical methods as well. Right. So when do we sterilize? When do we disinfect? Well. Critical items such as surgical tools, which penetrate our skin, basically um, they bypass our natural barriers. Well, we need to sterilize them and make sure that there are no microbes. Semi-critical, these include endoscopes, 
these don't penetrate our natural barrier, which includes our mucous membrane. And um, we also have non-critical items. So these are just external contact and we don't really need high level disinfection there. Finally, nosocomial infections. So it's just another word for hospital applied infections. Um, so we have hospital applied infections where something basically goes wrong with the normal sterilization and disinfection procedures. And so this allows for opportunistic pathogens to proliferate and infect patients. So very important, uh, nosocomial uh, microbes uh, are Staph aureus and also E. coli. And what are the ways that we can use to reduce nosocomial infections? Well, we can exclude the source of the infection. We can prevent transmission. So that includes through good hand hygiene and also decreasing host susceptibility. Right. And so earlier, David touched on um, bacteria and viruses. And I'll just finish off microbiology for this week with fungal infections. So fungi are eukaryotes that are obligate anaerobes, so they must have oxygen to survive. They can produce sexually or asexually, and they have what is a chitin cell wall with beta-glucans and um, ergosterol. So this is like our cholesterol, but different in structure slightly and that's in those cell membranes. Importantly, fungi come in three different forms, uh, yeast, molds, and they can be dimorphic, which is a, they can be either a yeast or a mold, depending on the temperature. Yep, um, so this table is credit to Piers Pingu. It's a fantastic summary of the different types. So for yeast, they divide through budding and producing daughter cells, and they are um, unicellular um, organisms. Um, yeast can also form pseudomycelia. This is where they sort of look like molds, but they actually are still made up of these small round structures. So example is Candida, Cryptococcus, and Pneumonocystis. Uh, so these are all fungi which exist as yeast. And so on the right, we have a little image here. So you can think of geese as sort of these round spherical organisms and they sort of um, replicate by creating a small bud here, which then grows. In contrast, molds, um, they grow by extending their hyphae to form mycelium. So hyphae, these are sort of these long strands over here uh, in contrast to the round shape of geese. And mycelium is a name for a large mass of hyphae. And these are multicellular. These strands are made up of numerous yeast, uh, numerous fungi cells, basically. You can also produce fruiting bodies and spores, which can be breathed in. So that's a really important part of why um, or how molds can also damage our bodies and cause allergies. So for example, aspergillus, it causes allergies when uh, we breathe in its spores. We also have dimorphic fungi. These can exist in both yeast and mold form, uh, molds at 25 degrees normally, and they turn into yeast at 37 degrees. So examples include penicillin, candida, and sporothrix. How this, did you talk about how candida has different temperatures? Um, oh yeah, so candida is the candida's reverse. Sorry, I think not sporothrix. I'll change that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, David. Candida is a mold at, at high temperatures and a yeast at lower temperatures. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I just think that was an exam once. An exam once. They do it to trick you because they swap it around for candida. And candida is also yeah. very clinically relevant. Cheers, mate. Sorry about that. Oh no, all good. Thank you. And so how do fungi actually cause disease? Uh, there's three methods. First, we have allergy. So we can have an, immune, an exaggerated immune reaction against fungi. And so examples include asthma, itching, sneezing, 
um, can increase production of mucus, cause redness, uh, pneumonitis, which is inflammation of our lungs, basically, and allergic alveolitis. So an example is aspergillus, and this can cause bronchopulmonary aspergillus, so that is so an allergic reaction. The second way, uh, fungi can produce toxins as well. So toxins from fungi have a specific, specific name, and that's mycotoxins. So for example, one of the toxins includes uh, aflatoxin, and this causes necrosis of liver cells. And it's a reason why we shouldn't eat food that has um, expired and uh, which may have um, fungi growing in it is because uh, fungi are producing these toxins so we can get food poisoning as well. Yep. And thirdly, fungal diseases, uh, fungi can also cause disease through infection. So, um, we have a specific name for fungal infections and that's mycosis. So think of micro as the prefix for anything related to fungi. And we have three types, cutaneous, subcutaneous, or invasive. So this just really depends on how deep our infection goes. So the most superficial is our cutaneous. So cutaneous infections involve fungi staying on the surface of our skin, although it can cause our skin to crack and may lead to secondary infection, which is subcutaneous. And um, fungi prefer warm, humid environments and also sweaty areas. And for cutaneous fungi infections, they form hyphae. And they also feed on keratinized cells. Remember your keratinized epithelial cells. An example includes athlete's foot. That's a cutaneous fungal disease. Then we have subcutaneous, which is a layer down, so underneath the skin. Um, these mostly occur due to inoculation. So for example, if you're pricked by a rose thorn, and the example here is sporothrix. And these are slow growing and takes about one to 13 weeks to sort of um, start to see symptoms after inoculation. Finally, we have invasive. This is basically where our infection reaches our um, deep tissue and starts to affect our internal organs as well. The main uh, method of entry in this case is inhalation. And um, for example, for candida, that's an example where this normal flora can turn opportunistic and it becomes an invasive pathogen. Yeah, and that's all for microbiology today. Um, yeah. There was quite a bit, but yeah. Yeah, you guys are doing well. Uh, we're going quite a bit, so I'm going to try and go quickly into this. I'm just going to make sure my room hasn't flooded though. So while I'm gone, Ken, I want you to think of like tissue types, organs, any structures that don't really repair, that can't repair themselves when they're damaged, and I'll be back. Did we get any ideas? Cartilage. Cartilage, good. The cartilage actually is quite well vascularized. Um, bones on, no, you're right. Cartilage is not well vascularized. So cartilage takes a long time to, that's why if you like damage your knee, it's particularly hard for it to regenerate because the um, cartilage there isn't good. Hyaline isn't great. Some nerves, nerves don't really. Big one is the heart, it's quite limited. But yeah, good job. Sorry about that cartilage thing. I'm just very concerned that I'm gonna flood my house. Tell your response to injury. So what are the normal functions of cells? So essentially homeostasis is essential for existence. And a physiological homeostasis is a balance in the body. And what will happen is in order to maintain homeostasis, cells adapt and respond to their external environment, triggers, insults, pathogens, everything involved to achieve homeostasis. So there is balance. 
So therefore often a stimulation or change in environment will evolve an output of the body to attain a steady state or to maintain a balance. In injury, the stimulus is often too great to be corrected by the adapt adaptation of cells and tissues. Adaptation can be morphological. In other words, their shape can change, their function can change. Um, often in injury is too great for them to change and for it not to be noticed. And if very severe, strain on the cell or tissue may initiate apoptosis or eventuate in necrosis. Does anyone know the difference between apoptosis or necrosis? Apoptosis is a controlled manner of like cell death that comes from like what injury or any other external stimuli, which is pretty normal. And then necrosis is just due to like, um, it's, a, it's one that's not controlled. Exactly. So um, apoptosis is often cell signaled, it's often signaled, necrosis often externally. Apoptosis is an active process, it requires energy, necrosis is passive, things just die. And also necrosis is quite damaging to the cells around, tissue around, it releases lots. So I was talking about those enzymes before that can be released when cells die, it causes a lot of inflammation. Apoptosis is quite controlled and safe. Good job though. Um, this is a nice diagram for one of the lectures. You have homeostasis. You're going to have stress, adaptation. Um, there might be injury. The injury could reverse and you get normal cells or it can just adapt and it's those normal. Um, if it gets pretty bad, if you have cell injury and let's say you have constant injury, very severe injury, very acute injury, constant injury, severe or acute, it can progress to irreversible injury depending on the tissue you're in as well, the size of the injury. Some tissues are very labile. Labile means their cells proliferate really quickly. Uh, think of examples of labile tissues. Someone hit me up. It's all over your body. That's right, your skin. So your skin is a really labile tissue. And so that's probably gonna be more likely not to lead to irreversible. It's probably gonna be reversible. But something like your heart or your pancreas, if it's very severe, can be irreversible and can lead to necrosis or if it's cell signal to apoptosis. Um, obviously not every stimulus change in the body is pathological. The body is in a constant state of fluctuation in the attempt to reach homeostasis. I'll hit, see the chat. Um, when will the injury lead to apoptosis? Um, usually a sudden acute injury is going to lead to necrosis. The word injury itself is kind of implying necrosis because it's implying it's uncontrolled. But sometimes your immune cells will see that other cells are infected or injured and they're going to initiate apoptosis for example, in virally infected cells. Yeah, I hope that's okay. Does that make sense? Oh, I can hear the parts, it's really bad. Does that make sense? Awesome. Okay, um, physiological, um, both internal and external stimuli that may lead to adaptive changes in the cells. The change can be internally in your body. For example, you can have gastric acid and the acid can go up your um, your esophagus, and that can be an internal stimulus that leads to adaptive changes. The um, esophagus can respond by proliferating a lot, being more keratinized, being more squamous, or an external stimuli can be external, if that makes more sense. Um, this is necessary because humans experience different environments in different times, but however, and as often our experiences are unpredictable. So we have hormones and endorphins and chemicals to regulate us and give us some homeostasis kind of fluctuation. Um, when it's pathological, it's the stress and tissues which might lead to morphological and functional changes of cells that it can't handle in a steady state. Um, here are some principles. What can happen? What does this look like? What am I talking about morphological changes? Hypertrophy is increase of cells that lead to an increase in organ size. If you have heart failure, your heart has to really try to pump really, really hard, but it can't ever pump hard enough. So the demand is pump harder and it can't, and the muscles will start to get bigger and bigger and bigger in hypertrophy. That's an example. Hyperplasia is increase in the number of cells in an organ or a tissue. Um, I, can, I, can, I don't know why I can only think of the vagina, but I'm sure there's other examples where if they're exposed to a lot of trauma, often they'll kind of compensate by creating a lot of layers of cells, lots more cells. Atrophy is a decrease in cell size and number, which results in the decrease in size of an organ or tissue. You can have atrophy of organs like the kidneys. Often um, if you have, this can be congenital, it can be related to blood supply. Metaplasia is really interesting. It's a reversible change in which one differentiation, differentiated type of cell is replaced by a cell of another morphology. So if you have columnar cells, what's the function of columnar cells?
like basically secretion and absorption. If they're exposed to a lot of irritation, a lot of stimulus, they can kind of change. They can um, change, re-differentiate to become squamous cells and not necessarily anaplastic. Anaplastic is when they don't have specialized features. These actually change different differentiated cells. Um, if stress is too great or exposed for an extensive period of time, cell death may occur. Um, I made this little table, I made it a while. Ah, oh, yay, my pipe stopped making noise. As a fully for an hour and a half, how scary is that? Anyway, um, these are the etiology of pathology that can cause damage. So it can either be genetic or environmental. Um, when I think of SMPs, polymorphism, I think of type one diabetes. There's um, genetic um, predispositions that can lead to that. And that can lead to a, a rejection of the pancreas by the immune system. There's also environmental factors that can lead to injury. Um, um, this is from a cellular perspective. You can have physical, chemical, or biological events that lead to disease. I have a slide on this later. We've talked about what this looks like and what does it look like? What's its clinical presentation? Inflammation, redness, swelling, heat, pain, loss of function. A good rule for med is if you hear it a lot of times, that means it's important. So like today you've heard flora again, you heard it in immunology, so you know that flora is important. You know, inflammation is important because we haven't stopped talking about it sign of injury this is what the inflammation means you know that redness is a dilation of small blood vessels swelling is a, a result of the leakiness in the blood vessels as lead into like lymph being um, done in extracellular compartments heat is important for two reasons it um, like jonathan was talking about before it increases metabolic rate it increases the rate of immune reactions um, it's to less of an extent it's not good for pathogens um, pain, so you don't touch it. Um, loss of function, so you don't move or touch it. Don't make it worse. Um, this is a little cute little table talking about how different trauma can lead to different disruptions. So you can disrupt the um, integrity of the plasma membrane through mechanical. If you have oxygen, you're probably going to have a lot of problems that you need oxygen for the production of ATP, as you remember, through the aerobic pathway. Otherwise, you have buildup of lactic acid, which is unpleasant, can lead to acidosis. Yeah, this is your low yield you can read through your own time. Ionizing radiation, radiation can lead to mutations. And what influences the tissue response? I actually mentioned this before. I just kept repeating it, but the amount of damage that occurs, so that can be like over the size of the volume. If your whole body is being burnt, then you're going to have a very difficult time doing a tissue response versus a small portion. And the type of tissue involved. So it's both the what initiates the damage and what receives the damage. Label, lots of proliferation. Stable, permanent. Let's think of examples. I've given you examples for label. It's the skin, lots of proliferation. Permanent, um, the heart is an example. It's not necessarily true. There are recently identified some stem cells in the heart, but it's very limited. Uh, neurons, as we said before, another example, cartilage is a, I think cartilage is permanent, not stable. Can anyone think of an example of stable? Quite difficult. I'd be impressed if you could. I've mentioned this organ a couple of times, and you'll probably think it was random that I was mentioning this organ. It's a small, it's an it's a organ related in the mid gut, in the foregut, sorry, it secretes insulin. Pancreas, I was going to say that. Yes, pancreas. And um, the duration of injury also leads to the damage incurred by the toxin of the, the that influences the tissue response here's a little example of it so if it's short-term acute versus chronic chronic if you keep injuring the thing that can't repair every time it repairs it gets damaged the fiber gets damaged it produces even more like tough fibrous collagen it's harder to repair that's going to tend to repair it's not going to regenerate really as soon as you have fibroblast producing collagen that's a that's a repair reparation rather regeneration do people know the difference between repair and regenerate? Regenerate is if on my skin, if I have an injury, then the stem cells in the basal layers of my epidermis are going to come up and they're just going to replace it. I'm going to have completely regenerated that tissue injury. You can't see as injured, no sign of anything. Repair is generally a scar tissue formation. Um, example, skin epithelium can regenerate. Fibrin, we're going to talk about clots in a second, can be replaced by cells underneath and be restored to normal. Pancreas is limited in acute pancreatitis. 
that's reversible if the irritant is removed, chronic pancreatitis, disruption, and fibrosis. So it's limited. Um, heart, this, I, I put a lot of disclaimers because it's not really true anymore, but it is true. It's considered a permanent cell population. It has very, very, very limited regenerative ability, and it is very, and it often leads to permanent damage, mostly. For our purposes, it's permanent. What are the consequences? Can have reversible or irreversible damage? Reversible, can someone use the words repair and regeneration in the context of reversible and irreversible for me? Is repair reversible or irreversible? Irreversible. Yeah, very good. As soon as you have pipe glass putting down scar tissues, first intention, second intention healing. A second intention healing is generally going to be the integrity of the tissue as soon as you have collagen there is generally decreases a bit. And then we'll remember that um, repair is generally reversible, returns to baseline. Highly um, labile tissue if there's minimal period injury over a short period of time. And that's generally, it's actually quite, it's because of the available stem cells, which is why the skin is different to the epithelium. Limited stem cells in heart. They used to think there weren't stem cells in heart, lots of stem cells in the epithelium. Irreversible, severe persist, maybe unable to regenerate. And the outcomes of this, why do I put this so far down? Adaptation, change cells. Um, you can have the, the change differentiation. Um, so a columnar cell can become a squamous cell. Regeneration is just restoration and repair generally involves cell death being replaced by different cells and fibers. Um, this one, very quick. I th with Basically the reason why it's only me and Jonah today is other people aren't available. So I didn't really realize I was doing this until later. So I'm gonna do my best. What is hemostasis? Hemostasis is a process that stops blood loss. So you don't die. And it involves cells, platelets, and fibroblasts. It involves soluble proteins, coagulation factors, insoluble proteins. Oh, sorry, was there a question? Vagina, question mark. Yeah, I wasn't too sure either. I had a quick Google. I think. Um, What's the question? Um, if it's laid out. Yeah, Daniel asked whether vaginal yes. tissue was stable. I just meant so generally a place that, oh, why did I choose that example? A place that receives frequent trauma is going to be quite labor. So I could have just used the top of your mouth. That's going to be very labor tissue because you're frequently having food rubbing against it. And that's going to regenerate quickly because otherwise you'd have scar tissue there. And um, yeah, so I think I do think that, yeah, it just because of the nature of frequent disruption to the mucosa and epithelium there that it would be labor. But I guess it depends how anatomically specific you're being. But yeah, should have used the top of the mouth, that would have made more sense as well. Oh, good. Um, there's also enzymes involved. Um, injury to blood vessels will expose the extracellular matrix underlying it. Daniel, is that okay? Or do you reckon it's not? Oh yeah, sorry, just to, yeah, just to add on to that. Um, the reason why vaginal tissue can be considered labile is that um, sort of the top layer of the epithelium of the vaginal tissue sort of gets shed off and it gets replaced by um, new epithelial tissue, which grows from the basement membrane. So really very similar to what your skin does. Yeah, that's yeah, really just, This doesn't form keratinized, doesn't form a keratinized layer at the very top, but other than that, quite similar to your skin. I think rectin is laid up as well as labial tissue there, just because of the nature of the abrasion. It's frequent, but um, yeah. What's the buccal cavity? Because that was an exam question. Uh, buccal cavity is the oral cavity in the mouth. Okay, yeah. So say for bets, they're gonna ask you about the buccal cavity, which is the oral cavity, which is labile. Um, vaginal is the reason I wouldn't mention the rectum either. I probably, yeah, I probably should have mentioned that. That's my bad. Um, injury to blood vessels will expose the, I hope everyone's okay with that. If you're not, let us know. If necessary, we'll research more. Um, injury to blood vessels will expose the extracellular matrix underlying it. And you're going to have some proteins that when activated or exposed to the blood, they're soluble proteins traveling through the blood. And they're often 
covered by this epithelial mucosal layer, not epithelial layer. When that's destroyed or destruct, there's destruction involved, you're going to have some collagen being shown. And the soluble proteins know that they should not interact with the collagen. When they do interact with the collagen, then they know there's a problem and they're going to stimulate platelets to come and aggregate. And the thing that activates them, that connects the collagen and the platelet is something called von Willebrand factors. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but it's called von Willebrand. I want to repeat it because it's important. Von Willebrand factors, you also have particular glycoproteins. So they will be on the extracellular matrix. They shouldn't be there because normally it should be covered by epithelium. Um, soluble proteins will interact with it. It'll lead to a cascade. that will lead to activation of platelets. And um, yeah, we'll talk about that more in a bit. And clots are dissolved after injury heals temporarily. So another restasis, another reason why it's called hemostasis is it's the balance between the activation of hemostasis, which is that clotting cascade, and the destruction of the clot called fibrinolysis. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, hemostasis, beautiful, nice picture again. You have vessel injury. The vessel injury can either be internal or external. It can be an injury from inside the lumen. That's um, shaking off epithelium or you can have a serious injury that's externally damaged the vessel. Um, what's a bit confusing is if it's, I'll talk about it later. Um, there's three steps to hemostasis. Um, one is vasoconstriction. Can anyone think why you want to vasoconstrict? The answer's there, Never mind. It's to reduce blood flow. It's also so you don't have blood loss. And that's mediated by two mechanisms that are in the next slide. Um, there's a sympathetic reflex, and there's also the release of serotonin and sometimes thromboxin A2, which you don't need to know about, but that's what aspirin inhibits in order to prove it. Coagulation. Um, a platelet plug is usually temporary. It's primary, um, the primary mode. It's what happens first when you're forming a clot. This collagen exposure von Willebrand factors will bind and it um, leads to platelet irrigation and a primary hemostatic plug. Um, secondary hemostasis is a creation of a fibrin clot. That's really, it's stable, it's a plot, it's the end, end game. Um, vasoconstriction to minimize blood loss and blood flow, damaged endothelium and associated tissues. Um, it leads to release of serotonin, which can cause a reflex vasoconstriction or nervous system, fight or flight, sympathetic. You don't need to know about serotonin. You don't really need to know about the base. nervous system. You just need to know there's vasoconstriction to minimize blood loss. A primary platelet plug is caused by damage to the endothelium and will lead to the exposure of underlying ECM. Primarily, it's relevant, collagen is very relevant in this case, and these contain thrombogenic factors such as von Willebrand factors and glycoproteins. Platelets will bind to von Willebrand factors, leading to their activation. When platelets are activated, they're going to call other platelets to come around. When they're activated, they're also going to grow sticky and cover up that little hole that's shown. Once activated, they'll link together through fibrinogen clots. Um, I haven't described what fibrinogen is, but it's just think of it as fiber. Um, step three, secondary hemostasis. So once the active primary platelet plug has been activated, it's gonna activate the secondary hemostasis. Um, this is when a concentration and circulation of soluble proteins responsible for blood coagulation act on a template provided by platelets in the primary platelet plug. So you have a primary platelet plug, but now I just said that, or a primary platelet plug, but now you want fibrinogen fibrin interconnections to make it more stable. And that's going to be done by soluble proteins and the mechanism we'll discuss shortly. And that mechanism is coagulation. The coagulation cascade is triggered by the sequential activa activation of enzymes and coenzymes. If there's typos, I don't really care, but if it's like content, then I change it. So I don't forget. Um, and this results in the formation of fibrin, which cross-links to create a firm plug. Whoa, scary. Okay. Um, first, I'll talk you through the picture, then I'll tell you the stuff you need to know. Intrinsic pathway occurs through the damage to the blood vessels. Often, think you can think of a lumen outward, and it's initiated by contact activation through exposed endothelial collagen. And these clinogen, this is like on Villabrands here as well. So you have... How are you going to... Yeah, so you have 12 to 12A, 11 to 11A, 9 to 9A, 8A, 10, 10A. 
you, you're just going to have to sit down and remember it. Nice way to remember it. extrinsic pathway. I know the extrinsic pathway is mediated by tissue factors. Tissue factors are proteins released when there's damage to endothelial cells. They release them when they're damaged, which is pretty cool. Um, this trauma, you're going to have seven. I know extrinsic pathway trauma seven is associated to tissue factors. And then starting from 12 downwards, 12, 11, 9 is going to be intrinsic. And I know 8 acts as an enzyme here. Um, there's a final common pathway, which is where both intrinsic and extrinsic pathways combine. And these combine to make fibrin, which is the end game, end result of all of this. Does that make questions? Please, questions. I'm sure this doesn't make sense. A good way to revise this is to sort of just sit down and have a go at drawing it out. Yeah, um, it will make a lot more sense after looking at it a few times. So don't worry if it's a bit daunting at the moment. Yeah, and start at the start. Start with, I know seven is extrinsic. I know they combine at 10. There's just high yield basic stuff that you can tell. Um, you do just have to sit down. I'm sure there's some mnemonics on the internet. What are the numbers? What is a TV channel? <laughs> we'll get there. So, um, and also another reason why it's named strangely is because they were named when they were discovered, not in their order. Let me help Hasner out. Um, these are activated in secondary hemostasis as coagulation cascade. What TV channels are like channel seven, channel nine, 10. Is SBS channel two? I don't know. I don't watch television, but who watches television? But this is when vitamin K is required. And they could ask you questions about this. This is quite high yield. And it's easy to remember because it's just the TV channels. So um, another reason why it's important and the real reason why they teach it to us is because warfarin acts by inhibiting vitamin K and it's an anticoagulant. You don't need to know that though. Um, two is ABC. Is two ABC? I don't know. I don't watch the news. I read, I read the news. All of these are news channels, exactly. Calcium is required for 1, 2, 7, 8, 10, 11. You don't really need to know that. I just want to put it in for completeness. Definitely know the vitamin K. Definitely know the TV channels, 2, 7, 9, 10. The reason why they ask you is because later on, you're going to need to know how warfarin works. So that, that's just so you know it's important, but you don't really need to know that one. It was assumed knowledge for second year, though. So maybe you do need to know the warfarin stuff. But yeah. Make sense? Hasan, is that all good? The, oh, why do you mean the numbers? The numbers are related to these numbers. Yeah, so thrombin is two. And I should also say um, A is the activated form. 12 to 12A, A is when it's been activated. The active and activated form then works as an enzyme in the conversion of 11 to 11A. 11A will then work as an enzyme, 9 to 9A. Some of these are enzymes, some of these are coenzymes. Formation of a clot, this is Pretty difficult. Thrombin 2A. So you have prothrombin becoming thrombin. Pro is beautiful because you know it's like it needs to be activated. Thrombin then acts on fibrinogen to form fibrin. Fibrin is what makes the clot a clot. Um, and so thrombin cleaves fibrin to make fibrin monomers. This is a fibrin monomer. You can see it here. Um, and a fibrin polymer is when these connect together and then make this little structure over here. These are soluble. What you need though, is where's 3A? You need factor 3A here. And factor 3A is activated by thrombin 2A as well, as well as, and yeah, so 3A is activated by thrombin as well. And that's what stabilizes the network cross branching and it makes a whole network that stabilizes into a clot. There's another name for factor 3A, but 13A, that isn't that one. Did I say three? Oops. Let me make sure I said that all the words right. So I'm going to say the wrong words. This is 13, not three. I hope I didn't say three. And that's 13A. And 30, factor 13A. Um, what's it called? Zymogen, you don't need to know that. No, you just know it's 13A. You know it's activated by thrombin. There's a loop there. So it's a bit cool. Thrombin is going to lead to the formation of fibrin and to the formation of 13A, which supports the fibrin crosslinking, which makes this clot stable. Um, fibrinolysis, the other end, is really important to remove clots. Clots can prevent um, 
why is it important to remove clots? Can you think of any conditions that are, um, maybe when you're flying, do you know why they get you to shake your legs out and walk around up and down? Do you know what that's called? DVT. Exactly. Do you know what DVT is? Deep vein thrombosis. Yeah. So it's generally when a clot forms in your lower leg, it's called thrombosis. And when that throat moves to other areas of the body, it's called an emboli. And it's incredibly dangerous because it can obstruct blood vessels and lead to ischemia and necrosis. So plasmin is really involved, important in dissolving the clot. Um, the destruction of plasminogen to plasmin, plasminogen to plasmin, sorry, the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin is converted by TPA and UPA. TPA stands for tissue plasmogen activated. It's located in the tissues. UPA is urea something. I can put that in. That's really bad of me. Sorry. Um, UPA. John, can you just see what UPA stands for? It's urea, urea, urea something. It's not important, but I just like it to be there. Um, you can see how as plasminogen is breaking down fibrin, it's going to be broken down into these little segments. And this is a D-dimer. And there's X and Y segments. You don't really need to know much about the segments. Definitely no D-dimer. D-dimer is a fibrin degradation product. And a very high D-dimer could indicate a previous large clot. Why does a previous high D-dimer, why does a high D-dimer in a blood test indicate that there could be a previous large blood clot? Maybe that's too obvious. Of a, yeah, sometimes when tutors don't get it, but when I ask a really obvious question, you're like, it's a trick question, but the reason is for there to be a lot of breakdown, it means previously there has to have been a very large blood clot. So that's your concern if you see high D-dimers. These are the screening tests for coagulation disorders. You also talked about the full blood examination. I didn't put that here because I didn't think it helped conceptually with the main point of this lecture, but you have um, PT, APPT, TT, fibrinogen, D-dimer. So do I have a picture of it here? I do. So. Can anyone guess what PT stands for? Let's see what the chat says. UPO is urokinase. Yeah, urokinase. Yep. That's just there for completeness. You don't really need to know what it is. Um, PT stands for prothrombin time. If we look over here, does anyone, factor seven, is this internal or external? Sorry to put you on the spot. Okay, I haven't looked at the chat, but if I tell you there's tissue factor there, does that help you? Oh, external. External. Beautiful, good job. So factor seven, external. What causes external? Do you remember? External trauma, that's obvious again. And that's associated with tissue factors, which are released when there's injury to the endothelium. Um, APTT is a measure of the time. Sorry, and these are all measures of time. It's the time taken to reach these end stages, these fibrin formations. Um, APTT is the intrinsic pathway, and it includes it's all of this, all of this. You have something called thrombin time, which is just the formation of prothrombin to thrombin to, fri to lead to fibrinogen, and this is an important measure as well, just to see how your clot formation is going. Important to remember APTT and PT include the common pathway. They have their own unique special internal external and they include the common pathway. Make sense? Good. Uh, signs of hemostatic disorders. Which one here is, can someone, what of the words here? What is this image? Take a guess. Any ideas? Does it look like it's a muscle hematoma? Does it look like it's a joint? Does it look like it's mucosal bleeding? Remember where are mucosa? They're like mouth. Mucosal bleeding is pretty gross to search up. So this is purpura. This is what purpura looks like. This one, any guesses of what this is? Yes, yeah, so this is gonna be a hematoma. These are some of the disorders associated. I remembered Christmas disease factor nine, but I don't remember if that was high yield to remember. John, was that high yield to remember this stuff? 
mm, it wasn't that high yield. I actually don't think there was even close to a question on it. But yeah, this is just maybe for interest. Um, vitamin K deficiency is important because which clotting factors are affected in vitamin K deficiency? I think in the chat. TV ones, which are two. What else? Beautiful. Um, most of these clotting factors are produced in the liver. So when you have liver disease, you can have clotting problems. And this is a way to assess liver disease. Christmas, yeah. Von Willebrand disease. What will happen if Von Willebrand disease? What happens if you have reduced Von Willebrand ex expression? Do you remember what, first of all, do you remember what Von Willebrand does? What does it activate? Starts with the P. Your platelets. I'm sure you all knew that, but um, Von Willebrand, or maybe you didn't, I wouldn't have known that to be honest, but Von Willebrand disease activates all your platelets. You don't have platelets activated. You don't have your primary plug. If you don't have your primary plug, you're not gonna get your secondary plug. You're not gonna get your fibrin, the solid clot. And you're gonna have to dumb disease disorders. Yeah. Um, who was the Russian dude, Rus Ruspertin? Um, so do you know, he had a clotting disorder, Ruspertin, hematuria, which is, okay, it doesn't matter. Sorry, I'm wasting time. Thrombosis finally is a formation of a clot and a dislodge and traveling of the clot is an emboli. Thrombosis can occur in artery or a vein. Why can they occur in the artery or vein? They really, it's just because of stasis. Lack of blood flow means they can aggregate together, form fibrogen connectants. They can block or occlude vessels, lead in ischemia and necrosis and a medical emergency. Virchow's triad, really important and it's very underemphasized in the lectures. Three factors to Virchow's triad. You need endothelial injury. This disruption can be due to atherosclerosis. So we've learned about they used to think that the reason atherosclerosis occurred was because of injury to the endothelium and then inflammatory mediators were built up and the LDL would accumulate there. That's no longer really relevant. It's maybe relevant in like some, sometimes you get young females, sometimes it's a mechanism of action, but really it's more of an inflammatory response, but maybe it's an old table. Vasculitis and toxins, any disruption to the endothelium. Um, you have abnormal blood flow, which is a fancy way of saying stasis. Do you know what stasis is? Can you think of a stream? So if the stream's not flowing down, it's just like kind of washing around. They can all clot together. And if you have abnormal coagulation, which can lead to um, kind of something with your potassium, with your vitamin, not potassium, with your vitamin K, with your liver hypercoagulability. Yeah. Um, that's all. I'm going to search up respiratory medical conditions so that it doesn't annoy me. And it is hemophilia so he had very limited clotting at all and he would bleed anyway he touched it is a good song okay thank you so much for joining us i hope the last the last one was rushed because i didn't realize i was doing it till quite late but um <laughs> yeah any questions oh good job on getting yeah it's a tough week but it's really interesting